Today I need to make breakfast, get the kids ready for school, finish my work proposal, help my husband find his wallet. I've got to pick up my daughter from soccer practice, and then a meeting with Brian, and then another meeting with the other Brian, who I can't even stand. Just keep your eyes closed. Stop thinking about your life and your job and your bills. It seems like craziness never stops. Is there a way to reduce your stress, relax your mind, and help you sleep? With today's message about finding calm in the middle of crazy, here's Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. Do we live in a crazy world? <laughs> we do. It just seems like, you know, nothing can top what just happened last week. But then it, something does. We, uh, we're in a series, how to, uh, how to Stay Calm in, in the Middle of a Crazy World. And today we're going to talk about overcoming fear. And I have this theory that I told you last time. And the theory is pretty simple. If you don't laugh, you'll cry. And so do you want to laugh a little bit today? Okay, we'll, we'll laugh. Now, uh, I found some comics again, and I think these comics are, are very appropriate for our topic and, and the weird, how weird our world is and, and some of the things that we're doing we don't even realize we're doing. And so remember last time I showed you the, the wall phone. Y'all remember those? They had these things called landlines. <laughs> and you had to plug in your phone to the landline and your phone was in a fixed position. But the nice thing about that was, put the first one up, you always remembered where you left your phone. You didn't have to worry about that. Well, I found two more that I think are along the same lines and very appropriate for helping us to kind of chuckle a little bit in the middle of a crazy world. And uh, don't show the next one until I say, can I, can I trust you guys on this? We had a little bit of trouble last week with our, our projector uh, uh, people. They're, um, I believe volunteers, and but well-trained, excellent, excellent. Everyone's really top-notch until I ask them to do something a certain way. And then, I don't know, the wheels come off somewhere. And I think, they, I think they're just very, very nervous. They're, they're fearful <laughs> that I'll be upset that they do it wrong. And when you get so scared that you, that you do something wrong, guess what you're going to do? You're going to do it wrong. Okay, why did you take that off? I'm just kidding. That's fine. So they're like, because you kept talking. Okay, so you can put the next one. Well, hold on, not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, here. So the next one, um, the invention of the phone Alexander Graham Bell, it was in 1876, uh, put this one up. So moments after he made the first phone call, he received the first warranty <laughs> phone call. And so for those of you listening, I'm, I apologize, for those of you listening and uh, not watching, it says uh, on March 10th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell makes the first phone call ever, and moments later he was notified that his car's extended warranty had expired. And I tell you what, I am so impressed with these warranty companies because they have given me last chance warnings about 100 times. They were so sweet to keep making sure that I don't miss the last chance. And, and they'll literally say, this is it. Today is the last day. And then they called tomorrow. I'm like, they're so nice. They're so nice. So uh, one of our staff members, uh, he shouldn't do this, believe me. This is not Christian. This is not right. This is not Baptist, okay? But he'll say to them, yeah, my car has 500,000 miles on it. And they said, oh, no, sir, you mean 50,000. No, he said, no, 500,000. And they said, well, you don't qualify. He says, okay, goodbye. And, but they keep calling him back, too, so I don't think they believe that. All right, so then we have another one, and uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of the sad reality of, of how we are with our, with our phones. You know, it used to be not so easy when it was on the wall, but now I find myself communicating, you know, researching, uh, whatever. I'm always looking down at this stupid thing, okay? So put up the last one, and this one's good. Uh, there's two people walking. It's... Uh, it's Bell walking with the phone in his hand. It says, now that I've invented it, I have this odd compulsion to hold it in my hand wherever I go and glance at it incessantly. <laughs> so it's weird, isn't it, that we, we live in such a weird world, but, but we do. We do. So what, what we're going to talk about today is, is how to overcome fear, and that is a big part of, of, 
uh, people's lives. We, we are people that are fearful. And I, and I want you to, we're going to go in Scripture in mainly two places today in the Old Testament that will help us understand how we're going to get past living in fear. Not to say you'll never have a fearful moment, but you'll get past living in fear. I think one of the biggest problems that Christians have is we don't take hold of the promises, the spiritual blessings that God has promised us. We don't ever possess the things that God ha- ha- wants us to possess. It's like this man, about 100 years ago, he was a young man and he moved from England to the United States. He actually ended up here in Chicago. And this is a true story from what I understand. He, uh, he came here and then he almost just disappeared. No one heard of him, no one knew where he was. And so maybe about a year later, he had an uncle that died in England and his uncle left him $5 million. $5 million 100 years ago? It's a lot of money. But nobody could find him. They literally, Scotland Yard literally did this big investigation trying to find this guy to make sure he gets his inheritance, but they never found him. But then one day he was found at the door of a cheap hotel. This will tell you how long ago. The hotel room was 25 cents for one night. And they found him dead, frozen, in that doorway of that cheap hotel. The man did not even have 25 cents to pay for a night in that hotel, but he was heir to $5 million. I believe that's a lot of Christians in our world today. We have been promised all of these things by God. He has basically already given it to us, but we don't possess it. We don't take hold of it. We live in fear. We live in fear that, you know, that, that the world's in trouble. And it is, believe me, it is. Uh, they, they live in fear of the pandemic. And certainly we need to take precautions, but we, we cannot live in fear. We cannot live that way. We live in fear because of, of maybe a health issue in our life, and we're not certain, you know, what's going to happen next or how bad it's going to get. Am I going to ever get better? And you live in fear of, you know, marital problems or, or problems with your, your children or, or your, your colleagues or whatever it is. You're always living in fear. But I think that there's a much better way. Not to say we should never be concerned about things, but should those, can, should those things ever overwhelm us to the point where it makes us cease to function? No. What we're going to talk about today is, is Joshua. Joshua was a very young man. He, in Joshua 1, in verse 1, he is now the leader. He is now uh, given the command of the people of God. Moses had died. And uh, it was now time to possess the land. You remember the story of Israel? They were slaves in Israel. They had grown to a mighty nation. And God used Egypt. He used that time, Joseph, Uh, The famine, Joseph being sold into slavery, saving his family and others from that famine. They grew and prospered in Goshen, and they've actually found all of that archaeologically, which is really cool. And then a new pharaoh came and was worried about this Semitic people that had grown so big and powerful in his land, and he started to enslave them and make them work hard. And then God raised up Moses, the the little baby that the mother put into a, a a bushel basket and floated in the the river, the daughter of Pharaoh, finding the baby, raising the baby, Moses eventually being used of God to come and to lead the people. Well, unfortunately, Moses had a moment where he was angry and he struck a rock twice. You say, what's the big deal? Because it was a picture. The rock is Jesus. The rock was struck once. Jesus died for our sins and rose again. But because of his anger, God said, okay, you're going to be able to look into the land, but you're not going to be able to go into the land. Isn't that sad? And by the way, the people could have gone right from Egypt into the land. But because of their unbelief, because God said, okay, I'm going to give this to you. This is yours. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. And they sent in spies, and they said, wow, 
this land is really amazing. They had, uh, it took two men to carry a bushel, of, or a, a cluster of grapes. Two, on a pole, two men to carry a cluster of grapes. I mean, this was truly a bountiful, prosperous land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But then some of the spies said, no, it's, it's too great, it's too powerful, the cities are too fortified, we can never take it. But two said, no, God said we can do it, let's do it. One of them was Joshua. The rest had to die in the wilderness, and it was 40 years, they could have gone right in, but they didn't have that trust in the Lord that parted the Red Sea. Can you imagine that? You saw with your eyes this massive, deep body of water, it's basically an ocean, the Gulf of Aqaba, parted, where you're walking across on dry land, as soon as you get to the other side, the Egyptian army comes across and the seas close on the Egyptian army. You saw that with your eyes. You heard that with your ears. It had to be quite the sound. And you've already forgotten that, not that long after. So you're, you're, you're not trusting the Lord anymore. But that's our problem. That's the problem that we have today. It's, it's the same God, okay? But, but we don't have that, like, Lord, I, I believe in you. I trust in you. I, 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 want, I, I want to not be afraid of this circumstance, of this issue. I, I just trust you in this. And then you have a peace and a calm in that situation. But we don't do that. We're fearful people. But now it's time. They're going to go into the land. Joshua is now the leader. Look at Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. It says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. I wonder what Joshua's mindset was. You know, man of faith, obviously, but this is still a big deal. He had seen with his own eyes these cities. We've been able to do research and TV episodes at Jericho. And certainly Jericho was a heavily fortified city that looked, if you stood at the bottom of Jericho and looked up, it just went up and up and up and up. These massive, massive walls. Like how could you possibly conquer that? He was gonna lead the people into this land and conquer not only that city, but many others. Heavily fortified, the Canaanite cities were heavily fortified. I've seen all the evidence, I've walked it, I've seen these massive stones that are still in place. How do you conquer that? It seems insurmountable. There's no chance that I can possibly overcome this issue in my life. Do you serve a big God? Did, 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 did God express his his undying love to you by sending his son for you? Did he promise to never leave you or forsake you, to be a friend that's closer than a brother? I mean, these are promises of God to you. And, and one thing I don't want you to do is confuse Israel and the church. I'm not saying we're replacing Israel. God has a future for the nation of Israel. The promises he gave to Israel are not the promises he gave to us, but he did give us promises, and he's a promise-keeping God, and so what he promises us, he will do. But certainly, at least in the back of Joshua's mind, he had to have a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of fear, a little bit of worry. And we have those same, that's a human thing. It's, it's a human emotion to have these anxieties and fears and worries. How can you find calm in the middle of such craziness? Well, let's hear how Joshua did it. Look at verse three, Joshua one. Every place, God says to Joshua, that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you as I said unto Moses. Now that's a very interesting verse, right? And God has had promised them a, a massive land. I'll, I'll show you the verse in a second. The next verse talks about how big of a land that God promised, not this little sliver that they have today. But the Bible says, God says, everywhere you put your foot, Joshua, you will have it. That's a pretty cool promise. And you know what they've discovered in Israel? They've discovered massive footprints. I mean, I'm talking about football field-sized footprints 
a stone, like a, like a small stone wall that you can see if you're, if you're above. You can look down and see this. And they've they found them, and they, they, they're very curious, and there are these footprints that are going up the Jordan Valley all the way up to the place that in, uh, in later in Joshua, after they conquered the first two cities, they went to a place called Mount Ebal. And they there renewed the covenant in Mount Gerizim. We're going to talk about that today because it ties in not only with this message about overcoming fear, but also something that I've been party to, and that's a major archaeological discovery that came from Mount Ebal. I'm going to show you a video. This is just a clip from an In Grace episode that we aired a couple years ago. This one's called Joshua's Conquest. We've renamed the series Discover Hidden Israel 1.5. Why? Because Discover Hidden Israel is a really great series name. And uh, so we're renaming this one, Joshua's Conquest, Discover Hidden Israel 1.5. And in this, Dr. Stripling, who is the archaeologist, he's one of the only, there's only two archaeologists in the lands of the Bible. There's hundreds of digs going on. There's only two that believe the Bible. And he's one of them. Okay, so he's been a, a frequent guest on In Grace. Let's see what he, he has to say about these footprints. We're going to talk about Gilgal, or Gilgalim, mm -hmm. which is the encampment that when they went to conquer Jericho, they went to Gilgal. So is that a geographic location, or as Adam Zertal believed, mm. could be these footprint structures that we're finding and we're standing at one right now? Right. Well, we don't know for sure, but my sense is that these were probably campsites, a series of them, so it could be both. I mean, these encampments could have been tribally, so each tribe encamping at one. This is the largest of the footprint sites here, and maybe the largest tribe was here. And the footprint would be significant. If God is saying, everywhere your foot sets down on the land, yes. I will give you. Sure. This is intriguing. This is interesting. There's a lot more study and research that has to go on, but a series of footprints as they take the land that God right. promised them. Well, if we can date this to the series of the conquest, then it's amazing. We've got an altar here in the middle of it. We've got a large enclosure, and it seems to match pretty nicely. All right, well, we got our plan. All right, let's go. I was absolutely blown away at what I saw at Gilgal Argamon. Could these really be leading us to the next scene in the story of Joshua's conquest, Mount Ebal? The only way to find out was to go to another footprint. But this one, near Rimonim, was not going to be easy to get to. So to get to the Gilgal site, we're going to have to get on a safari bus. Looks a little scary. Here we go. The footprint of Rimonim, and the footprints are pretty significant here in Israel. It's kind of more recent discovery. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Adam Zertal discovered five in his survey of Manasseh in the Jordan Valley. He found this one through aerial survey for using satellite yeah, imagery. He, he figured it would be one here, so he got out the maps and started looking, and lo and behold, he found one. He nailed it, and you know, there's probably six more out there. So these are remnants of the conquest, and that's what we're talking about here in Israel, and the footsteps. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, and again, they're, they're not positive exactly uh, what they are and why they're there, but it seems to really tie in with what we just read in the Bible. Everywhere your foot shall tread. And Scott feels like that might be the enclosure that held the tabernacle uh, before they eventually brought it to Shiloh, and that's where it stood for over 300 years. And so that, uh, what you see on the screen now, those of you that are listening, I'll try to describe it to you, is uh, Mount Ball on the left of the... Uh, the screen, you see the footprint there. There's another footprint and a archeologist who was a secularist, he didn't believe in God, he was an atheist. Adam Zertal found that footprint and found what uh, he believes is Joshua's altar. You know, the Bible says they went up, 
they did this covenant renewal ceremony on Mount Ebal, the Mount of Cursing. That's half, half of Israel was on one, half of Israel was on the other. And they shouted back and forth, blessings and cursings. If you will obey your father and mother, you'll be blessed. And then on Geriz, and, uh, Ebal, they shouted back, if you disobey your mother and father, you will be cursed. And, and this went on, this shouting back and forth of thousands of voices between the city of ancient Shechem, and that's where Abraham was, and that's where others, Jacob was, his well is, that's where Joseph was buried. And this went on, back and forth, Mount of blessing, a mount of cursing. Why would the altar be on the mount of cursing? Well, if you don't disobey God, you don't have a cursing. You, you, you only have a blessing. You don't need an altar. But praise be to God, he's a merciful God, and if you'll come to him in sorrow, he will uh, forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and restore you in fellowship. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about fellowship, fellowship between Israel and God and fellowship today. We, we come before God humbly and say we've, we've sinned or we've, we've messed up and restore that fellowship. Confess that, re re be restored. And so this was an amazing discovery. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute, but these footprints are intriguing, aren't they? So look at verse four. How big was the land that God promised Israel? Everywhere your foot will, will trod, I will give you that land, and you see the footprints. Joshua 1.4 says, from the wilderness, so that's south, that is all the way to Egypt, possibly including Egypt, and this Lebanon, of course Lebanon is just north of Israel, even unto the great river, so if you go east, you'll come eventually to the river Euphrates. I mean, this is massive. All the land of the Hittites, that's part of Turkey. Uh, unto the great sea, of course, that's the Mediterranean going down to the sun. The sun would set, if you're in Israel, at the, uh, at the Mediterranean. Shall be your coast. And this is massive. You know, today they have a sliver. They were promised by God 300,000 square miles of land. At the most they ever possessed, they ever claimed, was 30,000 square miles. They only claimed about one-tenth of what God said could be theirs if they just had trusted him. And that seems about the right percentage of what we claim as Christians that we could have. It's about 10% of what we could have if we just trusted the Lord in these matters. I feel like there, there's a correlation there and a lesson there. Joshua 1.5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. These are incredible words. These are encouraging words. Don't you think Joshua needed to hear these encouraging words? As I was with Moses, God says to Joshua, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Wonderful words. And have you ever feel abandoned? And have you ever fear abandonment, being left alone? Everybody has that fear. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, verse six. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. There was an unconditional promise he gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to Israel that they would have this land. They don't possess it today and they possess part of it. Praise God, they've been regathered. An amazing fulfillment of modern, a modern day fulfillment of prophecy. But the full fulfillment is that whole land that I just described to you, 300,000 square miles. That will be in the millennium. But Joshua needed to hear the words, be strong and courageous. Maybe you need to hear these words today from God. And as I stand here today, I try not to be giving you my opinion or my words. I'm trying to give you God's words. As an oracle of God, I want to bring forth to you what God wants you to hear today. And maybe God needs you to hear, fear not, be courageous, be strong. You feel like you need to hear those words today? I know I do. And, and here God is giving Joshua, as he's probably uh, being overwhelmed with the tremendous task upon him. And God gives him a fresh word of encouragement. Be Thou strong and very courageous. And you're gonna see a repetition of this as we go through 
reading the text. The words, I will never leave you, can be translated this way, I will not drop you, I will not abandon you. I'm reminded of a funny story. An airplane was flying over the Atlantic, and then suddenly the intercom, a voice comes over, and uh, the voice says, ladies and gentlemen, I would like for you to look out your right window and notice that both engines are on fire. I'd like for you to look out the left window and notice that we've had to shut down both of those engines. I would like for you to look down, and you'll notice a yellow dot with six smaller dots in it. That's the pilot, the co-pilot, and four flight attendants. This is a recording. Have you ever feel, felt abandoned? Have you ever felt like you're alone? Well, there's a promise of God for you. Again, the promises he's giving to Joshua, the promises he's, he's giving to Israel, those are unique to Israel. They've, they've been given a unique set of promises that they would bless the whole world. They have, right? They gave us Jesus. Did you know Jesus is Jewish? We cannot be anti-Semitic. We must love the Jewish people. T -t if you ever meet someone that's Jewish, say, I am so thankful for you. I pray for you. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You need to be a, a Zionist as well. You need to say they, that land is theirs. That doesn't mean you're anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab. You're not. We need to love every person. But we certainly need to love the Jewish people who have been uh, the one people group in all of history that has been uh, most attacked and maligned for no reason. So there's specific promises to Israel that aren't for us, but God has given us specific promises to not leave us, to not forsake us, to, to be with us, to help us, to give us the spirit of God. We have God in us. And so we have really nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. So the Bible is full of these fear not verses. Now somebody said there's one fear not or don't fear in the Bible for every day, 365 fear nots. I don't know that that's 100% accurate, but I know the Bible hundreds of times tells us to not fear. Okay? And that's a promise from God to you. And he gave this promise that you're not going to be abandoned. You're not going to be, some people think that you can lose salvation. Are you telling me that God would go to all the trouble of, of paying your sin debt by becoming sin on the cross, being buried and, and raised again, and then, and then save you and then throw you back? What, what type of father, what type of good father would do that? So, you don't have to worry about being abandoned. You don't, have to be wor you don't have to worry if you mess up that God's gonna just kick you out of the family. Once you're born, you're born. Now he might discipline you because he loves you, but that's because he loves you. How does God discipline? Well, he has his ways and he's really good at it. I would just suggest the closer you stay to God, you know, when I was a kid, I learned that the closer I stayed to my dad, the, the less it hurt when he spanked me. He didn't have that, you know, that swing. So may I suggest the closer you stay to God, the less that, that's ever gonna happen to you, okay? I just told the kids a little secret. I should not have told them that. We had, uh, we had one, one guy that, that gave us a, a spanking once, and he had these like bulging arms. It just like, it was, it was scary just watching him kinda, kinda get warmed up. It looked like a baseball player. Um, remember the baseball players? Uh, McGuire and, and Sosa, and they were, they were all, you know, juiced up. And uh, they, they, they had every vein popping in their muscles, and they were hitting all these home runs. We couldn't figure out why, and now we know. And then the bat, you, the cork bat. Anyways, I don't know where we got onto that. <clears throat> to stay close to God, that's the point. Stay close to God. And he's not gonna abandon you. He's, not gonna, he's never gonna kick you out, my friend. And there's a there, there, that will help you overcome fear. Knowing that once you have received by faith Jesus, you're saved today, tomorrow, and forever. There's a, an incredible security in that, that. You don't have to worry about being abandoned. Verse 7 of Joshua 1. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Do you see how God just keeps repeating that? Why? Because we need to hear it again and again. Sometimes you don't hear it the first time. Did you hear me? Sometimes you don't hear it the first time, so God gives it to you again. Be 
Thou strong and very courageous. Why? Because he's going to be going up against incredible odds, insurmountable odds. But with God, everything is possible. So you can do this, Joshua. You can do this, Christian. That thou mayest observe to do all according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. And, and by the way, Moses was the one that God breathed and wrote the first five books that called the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, the law. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand. We are so easily distracted. No, stay right where you need to be. Follow what God has told you to do. Know what he said. How do we do that? Well, it says, it says that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now we have, uh, we have the word of God. You need to know what it says. An hour in church isn't enough. You need to study it yourself. You need to read it. You need to memorize it. You need to meditate on it. You need to do it. You need to not leave it. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, thou, and, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, and then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And, and don't, don't think that you're gonna just do the things that God says to do so that you can be rich, prosperous in a material sense, but I'll promise you this, if you do what God tells you to do, and he enables you to do it by the Spirit of God that indwells you, you will be prosperous spiritually. You will have good success spiritually. Now, there's many liberals in the last hundred years that have said, and they'll, they'll almost, almost <clears throat> I would say, more scholars than not will say, this, you, you cannot depend upon this. This is uh, uh, unreliable, and those things that maybe happened are allegory or, mi or myth. So basically, you cannot trust this book is what they're telling you. Most scholars will say that, okay? They say, well, there's parts of it that have good moral teaching, but you cannot trust this book. They also will say this. They criticize the Bible by saying, Moses could not have written the books that he said he did because they did not have the ability to write in an alphabet. People were illiterate and, and they, they couldn't write. You know, they had cuneiform, they had pictographs, but if you were to write the Bible in cuneiform and pictographs, it would be volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes. Very complicated, tedious work. Someone invented an alphabet. An alphabet enables us to communicate by writing and reading. And they say that they didn't have the ability to do that back then. So this was all, if it was written by someone, it wasn't Moses, and it was written way later. So that, that basically just destroys everything in the Bible. If you're saying the first five books weren't written by the person who said he wrote it, when he said he wrote it, you can't trust the Bible, right? That's what modern scholarship liberals will say. And then there was a discovery. I'm going to play first a, a, a video from that same series that is In Grace, Joshua's Conquest, Discover Hidden Israel 1.5, and then I'm going to show you the, the discovery that we were able to go talk about in Houston this week. We're going to climb up the ramp and then we'll be up on top and we'll talk about sacrifice. And this ramp is very typical for yes. altars, especially even in the time of Shiloh and the time of uh, Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah, second temple period altar looked very much like this and that's what really caught Zertal's attention and caused him to begin to think that the Bible might be reliable mm -hmm. after all. He was a secularist, mm -hmm. a very atheistic secularist and what he found here changed him into a believer in the biblical text. Wow. So it's pretty amazing. All this information was inside the Bible. I did not believe it because I was educated differently. So all these debates in Congresses and universities were without data from the field. And I think the data from the field now is what counts. So that was Adam Zertal. That was a film that Dr. Carl Ball filmed with a group he had in Israel. That was Mount Ebal and Joshua's Altar. Adam Zertal was a secularist. He was an atheist. 
He was taught in university there is no God, the Bible is not true, it's unreliable, it's myth, it's fable. He started to go survey the land as an archaeologist, and he came across Mount Ebal, a pile of stones. He started to, to uncover it and do a dig there and found an altar that dated back to Joshua's day. Archaeologically, scientifically, that changed him from an atheist to one that believes in the Bible. He's passed away, but if you, if you want to be scientific, if you want to be if you want to look at, at, at exactness and science, it, it lines up with the Bible, okay? They'll tell you it doesn't, but it does. If you are objective and you look at the evidence, the Bible says Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal, and they find an altar on Mount Ebal that dates to the time of Joshua. Now, what's exciting is not just that altar that was discovered years ago, but when you do a dig, you dig out certain areas and you do it in a grid and you, you filter the materials. If you, if you don't see something right away, you take the dirt and you put it through a screen. It's called dry sifting. And then in doing that, they usually find things that they didn't find when they were actually doing the dig. So they, they find it that way. And then whatever uh, dirt is from that that they don't keep to study, they dump into a pile. And there were these, these called discard piles or dump piles on Mount Ebal. When we were filming Dr. Stripling in uh, 2019 for that series that you just saw, he said to me, he said, hey, Jim, uh, one day I'd love to go through that dump pile of Adam Zertal, and I want to take it and do wet sifting. Wet sifting is a, uh, you, you sift it, you dry sift it, you take those materials and you wash it. And you're sifting it again, but you're washing it. And, and Scott has been using this. He's the only dig in Israel doing this. The, uh, there's another a sifting project of the Temple Mount materials that they're doing that as well. That's where Scott learned it. But it's, it's expensive, it's complicated, but he's finding so much more that they just thought were, was dirt. And they're washing, they're finding bula, these, these scarabs. Uh, they're finding all sorts of things by washing this stuff. So he goes, <clears throat> gets permission, to take the dump pile from Adam Zertal and the Mount Ebal, he brings it to a, a, a Jewish community nearby, and he wet sifts it. In that, they find this small, it's about two inch by two inch, what's called a curse tablet. And that <clears throat> is the press conference that I attended. Put up the picture of the press conference. All right, so this was the press conference that we had in Houston. It was at a theological library, and it was announced there that this curse tablet, they had, they had found it. We had actually talked about it on In Grace uh, around the new year, but they, did, they were doing scans in Prague. They have a technology at a university there where they can do like cat scans, and they've done this with other artifacts and scrolls because it's too delicate to open, but they believe there's inscription inside. It's made out of lead, and they, they, they noticed on the front there was an inscription. And so they did these scans and they got the results back, and they've been able to decide what's inside. And what they found is really probably one of the greatest discoveries, uh, for sure, of, of our last, you know, 50 years or so. But it's, it's a major discovery, and it, again, reaffirms the Bible. So go to the next, the next slide. This is actually the cursed tablet that they found. Uh, front, back, and from a side view. It's basically a piece of lead that was scribed on with an iron stylus. And what they found by these scans is what they believe to be the oldest Hebrew alphabet script ever discovered in Israel by a couple hundred years. It dates back to the time of Joshua or around then. They did testing on the, on the lead. They know where it came from. In Greece, uh, they, they know the style of writing, and the style dates back to that early, early, early Hebrew in the land. So what does that prove? Go to the next slide. You want to know what is the curse? It's a curse. Why would they write a curse? Uh, and it's kind of it's eerie, right? Cursed, 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 cursed by the God Jehovah. They might say Yahweh. You will, you will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Jehovah. Curse, curse, cursed. It's a chiastic parallelism, which is kind of like some of the Psalms written uh, one way, and then they repeat it 
back so you could go backwards or forward with it. And it's basically someone that's saying, listen, it could be an individual or probably nationally. Maybe even, maybe even Joshua had his you know, technician, his scribe, uh, write this on this tablet, fold it, and put it in. And basically you're saying, if I disobey God, I'm accepting the consequences of that. I accepting, I'm accepting God's punishment for my disobedience. It's almost a legal thing. And it could be, again, for this individual, whoever left it there, but it could be for the whole nation of Israel. Either way, it dates to the time uh, early, early, early in Israel, in the 1400 BC, and it also is the name of God. The name of God. And it's early Hebrew. It shows that they can write. They did have the ability to write. And the Bible actually says it, right? You know, he, he just told Joshua, read the law, obey the law. The whole people sh- were, were able to read. That's what the Bible implies. And that's what they find. Again, the Bible is confirmed. Go to the next slide. And this is actually the, the uh, inscription of of Jehovah, the earliest inscription probably ever found in Israel for sure of the name of God, this, this, the, the eternal one, the self-existing one. And it's so exciting to be part of that, that discovery or, or the announcement of that discovery. And we were able to be with Scott on uh, the next day after the press conference driving to another conference where it's the first time he's speaking publicly about this find and he was on the phone the whole time. I got the drive, he was on the phone the whole time with press, Reuters, AP, ABC, uh, Christian outlets, of course, are covering this heavily. But you'll probably see more and more about this. And then they're gonna publish on this soon and peer review and all of those things that they do. But it's tremendous, it's incredible that they found it. So let me just say this. God did communicate to Moses. He spoke to Moses face to face. Moses faithfully recorded all that God had given him. And the first five books of the Bible were available to Joshua and the people. And they were to read it and to memorize it and meditate and do it and not depart from it. Look at Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. You heard it again, right? Be strong, be strong, be of good courage. Be not afraid. If you have a Bible, circle that. Circle, be not afraid. Now underline it. Now put a box around it. Don't be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You might be afraid today, but you don't need to be. There's a story about a a tiger in the jungle, and he catches a fox. The fox said, I I wouldn't eat me if I were you. The tiger said, why? He said, because I am the, the highest of all the created animals and if you eat me, you will go against God. If you don't believe me, the fox continued, the sly fox, by the way, he said, if you don't believe me, then I would like for, for you to follow me and see what all the animals do when they see me. And so they walked through the forest, the little fox and the big tiger, and all the animals scattered. And the tiger was impressed that everyone was so afraid of the fox. But in reality... The animals were afraid of him. And I liken that to us. We get to walk around with Almighty God behind us. What do you have to fear? If you were bullied as a kid and you were made fun of and taunted, imagine you had a big brother that was, let's say, six, nine, and fully muscled and let's say, a good 300 pounds of muscle, and he was always with you, you would never have to worry about being bullied, right? Truly. It eliminates fear, doesn't it? And, and that's really the truth. When we walk around, we have God in us, and we don't have to fear. Now, let me switch gears and, and switch over to Jeremiah 17.1. Jeremiah 17.1, as we close today, the lead tablet that was inscribed on Mount Ball was inscribed by a lead stylus. How do we know that, not lead, iron. How do we know that that existed? Jeremiah 17, one, also in Job, you find this. The sin of Judah is written with a, what? Pen of iron, with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart, upon the horns of your altars. 
So that shows you that that did exist, that they could have used that, and, and I'm sure did use that to inscribe that lead tablet, that cursed tablet. But just like Judah, just like Joshua, just like you and, and me, we've all sinned. Now, once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus is placed upon you, and when God sees you, he sees Jesus' righteousness. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west, and that's about as far as you can get. It's buried in the deepest sea, God says. So your sin is no longer an issue on your uh, presence in heaven once you've received by faith Jesus. But in reality, we still have an old nature, we still have the flesh nature that wants to continue right on sinning. And the one that you feed, the one that you nourish, will be the one that grows stronger. The new flesh, the, or the new nature, the spirit nature, or the, the old flesh. So when we give in to that old flesh, we, our hearts go further from the Lord. When we give in to, when we allow the new, the new nature, the Holy Spirit, to control us, when we yield to him every day, we're going to feed that nature, and that's the one that's going to win. The new nature is only good, the old nature is only bad. That's the battle of the Christian life. You don't have to worry about hell anymore. He's not gonna kick you out but we have to fight that battle every day. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, yield to the Spirit of God. And when you do that, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. On and on and on the Bible goes. In Joshua or Jeremiah 17, 5, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. That's when we get into trouble. When we trust in ourselves and other people. And maketh flesh his arm, his, his weapon. We cannot, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot protect ourselves and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Israel did this time and time again, and they faced God's punishment as a nation. For he shall be like the, the heath in the desert. Part of our Joshua's Conquest series, if you get the full version, you're gonna see Scott described this heath, or it's called an arara. An arara, is this, it looks like this big, luscious fruit hanging on a tree, but when you pop it, it it's full of air, and out of it comes a milky poison. And I was glad he was doing the demonstration and not me, because he got some of that on him. You know, it looks so wonderful, it looks so great, and there, it's, nothing, nothing, it's full of air and it's poisonous, the aurora tree. So, so the person that departs from the Lord, if you don't walk with the Lord, you depart from the Lord, you're gonna be like an aurora in the desert. Nothing uh, good is gonna come from that and shall not see when good cometh. But shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness and the salt land and not inhabit it. That was Israel's trouble. That's many Christians' problems. You're not claiming what God has given you. God isn't giving you a wasteland. God doesn't want you to have a life that isn't abundant, full of joy and hope. He doesn't want you to live in this wilderness land, this salt land, this non-inhabited land. Verse seven, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. Amen? And whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. It sounds like Psalm 1, doesn't it? And that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful. Don't let your heart be like that. Trust the Lord. And when you do, you don't have to fear. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then look at verse 14 as we close. You want hope? Do you feel like that, that aurora in the desert? Do you want to be like that tree by the river? It's bearing fruit, blessing, providing shade, providing beauty. That's what God can do for you and wants to do for you. Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Do you want to be saved from a life of fear? And the greatest fear, I think, is the fear of hell. Everyone deep down knows there is such a place, even the atheist. As the atheist is dying, the atheist is calling out to God to be saved often. Salvation is a free gift. Receive it, and you can be saved. God wants to save you. God wants to provide you salvation. He's actually already 
made the payment for your sins. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And now you have to possess it. You have an inheritance. It's incorruptible. God, God wants to bless you spiritually. Claim that. Claim that. And when you do, when you start trusting the Lord more and more and more to get you through whatever the issues are, you're going to see that the crazy world is suddenly going to become calm. There is salvation, but it's only through faith in Jesus. It's only through faith in the one true God. And yeah, there's, there's many proofs archaeologically, scientifically, that this is accurate, that it's true, but it still requires faith, right? Trust. Because you have to believe what God said. God said he wants to save you. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a promise of God. How do I know that's true? Well, we have all these proofs that the Bible is accurate and true, but how do you know it's true? That's faith, that's where you have to decide. I am putting all my eggs in that basket. I'm putting all my trust in Jesus. He's the one that came and, and, and died and rose again. He paid for my sins. I believe that. I trust in that. And if you'll do that, the Bible says you won't perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life, which is heaven. Your life, you won't have to live in fear of hell anymore because you'll be born again, a child of God. And then in Ephesians 2, it says in verse eight, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Receive a gift, how? By faith. By faith, believing, same word. Let this be us. This is our sin. We've sinned. We've all sinned. God is holy. Our sin separates us from him. Jesus came, perfect. He died for our sins on the cross. He rose again, and if you'll believe in him, look what happens. You'll have everlasting life. Have you received by faith Jesus Christ? Call on him, and he will save you. Trust in him right now. And once you do that, you have everlasting life. Now, possess the land. Possess the promises that God has given to you, which are spiritual which are amazing. And when you possess that land, when you take hold of the promises that God has given you, not for salvation, that's different, but in light of your salvation, you're gonna find that he is providing for you in amazing ways. And you're gonna see him doing great things. And that's gonna add to you trusting him more and more and more in your life. And you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Would you please bow with me as we close in prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed. Do you remember a time in your life that you've received the gift of God, the gospel? If you wanna be saved today, this is all you need to do. You can pray silently to the Lord, I'm a sinner. I've disobeyed, I've lied, I've cheated. I've not always loved like I should. I've hated sometimes. I've fallen but Lord, I, I put my faith in Jesus who died for all of those sins. He was perfect, but he, he paid the penalty of the perfect man, God dying for man. I trust in him, I believe in him. Not a church, not a religion, but in Jesus. I thank you, dear Father, for saving me, for giving me everlasting life. And if you've made that decision today, if you've prayed that prayer, can I pray for you? Can I rejoice with you? Hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand up right now. Say, Pastor Scudder, today I've made that decision. Hold it up for a moment. Let me pray for you. I won't embarrass you. Is there someone receiving by faith Jesus Christ? Yes. Are there others today? Between you and God, but I'd love to know about it and talk to you further if you'd like to. Is there someone else today? I put my trust, I put my faith in Jesus and him alone. We're so thank thankful, dear Father, for salvation that it's by grace, through faith. I thank you, Lord, that once we've received that, we don't ever have to worry about abandonment. Father, help us to live in light of what you've done and live a thank you life for our salvation. Help us to, to meditate, to read, to follow, to obey your word. That is accurate, that is true. Lord, help us to every day not fear the, the, the giant problems in our life, Lord, but trust you like David trusted you 
and he took down the giant. Lord, we know that you can do these things in our lives as well. Lord, help us to overcome fear by putting our trust in you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray these things and all God's people said, amen.